Well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see so many faces of the community here in one place. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I just wanted to say that this panel discussion is brought to you by grant funding through the American Library Association. Uh, we applied for and were awarded a grant called the Libraries Transforming Communities Focus on Small and Rural Libraries to host a community conversation about a topic of concern. Our village administration identified affordable housing as a topic that's mentioned frequently in this community. So tonight we have with us Nick Owen and Rowan Childs. Nick is our village administrator, if you wanna wave Nick. Um, and Rowan is the director of economic development. Thank you uh, for being here. And uh, again, the goal tonight is to provide more information about affordable housing. Our panelists will begin by discussing what is affordable housing, who is affordable housing for, why is it needed, and things like that. They will also discuss the process and barriers to bringing affordable housing to communities. Following the panel discussion, we will hold a community discussion. As Melissa said, please write your questions in the chat as we move through this presentation. And please know that we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, if you do have a chance to speak, please keep in mind the ground rules that we uh, sent out earlier via email and just went through um, a few seconds ago. Before I turn the meeting over to our panelists, I want to take a minute to let you know who they are and they will introduce themselves more fully. Tonight, we have with us Olivia Perry from the Dane County Housing Initiative. And if you just wanna wave when I call your name so people know who you are. Uh, Robin Farrow, the owner of Grumpy Troll, Sugar Troll, and a real estate developer. Um, Chad Wobin, Encore Homes developer. And Professor Kurt Paulson from UW-Madison, um, a professor of housing, land use, and municipal finance. So we're gonna start off tonight with Olivia Perry and I will now turn this discussion over to her. Can I share my screen now? Yes, I think that's a yes. Um, it says I can't, it's not allowing me to do that. Okay, try um, again, I just made you a co-host. Okay, here we go. Can everyone see that? Sorry, hold on a second. No problem. We all understand computers not participating in Zoom. Okay, I just couldn't get the. Uh... Okay, are we good? Can you see it? Okay. All right. Well, um, Jessica and Melissa, thank you so much for the invitation. And it's great to be here and see all of you. Um, and uh, hello to my fellow panelists. Um, very happy to um, be sharing this time with you tonight to talk about uh, affordable and workforce housing. So I'm going to cover affordable and workforce housing, just a brief overview from the county perspective. Um, I think uh, some of our other panelists are going to talk a little bit more specifically about Mount Horeb um, and um, some of the more specific things that you can do um, to bring this type of housing forward in your community. So uh, I thought I'd just touch on the basics. I'm not really sure how much people know or don't know, so I'm just going to go over some basics about what affordable workforce housing is um, and then talk about the background, you know, provide some background on the um, program and policies that we have at Dane County, um, some of our program highlights and um, ongoing need, and then look at a few population and household um, trends and opportunities. So um, affordable housing is um, uh, housing that's considered uh, no more than 30% of your monthly income. So for renters, that's, um, that includes um, rent and utilities. And for homeowners, that um, includes uh, mortgage, real estate, insurance, and utilities. Um, uh, a housing that is uh, a homeowner that's cost burdened um, spends more than 30% of their income on housing. And someone, a uh, ho household that's extremely cost burdened spends more than 50% of their income on housing. Um, for example, um, if you take a, um, a family of two um, person household or um, 
a household of, that's making 60% of the area median income at $48,060, they would be able to afford, according to WIDA, who's our state housing agency, a one bedroom for $1,126. Now I will let you know that most of the programs and the policies that we have at Dane County focus on households that are making 60% or below area median income. That's the hardest housing to um, actually bring forward because of its cost and subsidy. So um, here's some policy backgrounds. Um, as you know, we all have comprehensive plans and the comprehensive plan, the housing chapter in particular is the sort of guidance that I work with um, that's sort of mo most related to the work that I do. But the county also passed a resolution at housing is a human right in uh, Res 92 in 2012 and, and created a city county homeless issues committee because of the issue was uh, growing in concern. But we have a number of programs for affordable and workforce housing. Uh, CDBG and Home, we give out $1.2 million a year for gap financing for uh, new workforce and affordable housing, rehabilitation, down payment assistance, and weatherization. Um, we also have homeless and supportive services. And in 2015, the, man, the program that I manage, um, the Dane County Housing Initiative, was started along with the Dane County Affordable Housing Fund. Uh, and we also created a new uh, division this year, Housing Access and Affordability. Um, both the Affordable Housing Fund and the Dane County Housing Initiative has really grown exponentially over the last five years. And um, just briefly, the Dane County Housing Initiative is a program that provides, uh, we have monthly stakeholder meetings and you're all welcome to come to our stakeholder meetings. Um, we have a newsletter, um, a website, um, an annual housing summit, except for the past year. Um, we have uh, a lot of program and videos. So if you're interested in learning more about this subject, please feel free to go to our website. Um, there are dozens, literally dozens and dozens of educational videos that you'll find about affordable workforce housing. Um, I also provide technical assistance. And um, this year we're, we hope to kick off the Dane County Regional Housing Strategy at the end of the year, uh, which I can tell you a little bit more about later. Um, but so since 2015, um, our Affordable Housing Development Fund has provided $23 million in gap financing to develop 1,748 uh, low to moderate income units in Dane County, um, nine, nine of uh, nine communities in Dane County, Mount Hora being one of the recipients um, of the gap financing. Uh, we continue to do uh, re rehab, major and minor rehab, down payment assistance, gap financing. We created the beacon in the last five years and the uh, Office of Housing Access and Affordability continues to um, provide uh, um, a way to um, facilitate, facilitate the emergency federal funding that's coming for eviction prevention. And I will let you know that um, if you do know any, of anybody in your community that is um, in threat of eviction, uh, the Tenant Resource Center in Madison is uh, facilitating um, intake for applications for um, uh, for folks who have um, rent arrears up to 12 months. So um, please share that information. Uh, another highlight is that in 2015, we started, uh, when I started this program, um, we had three communities that were engaged in workforce and affordable housing, and now there are 10. And um, I just talked to Bob Whipperforth at a meeting, and he's the chair of the Dane County Cities and Villages Association, also the president of, of the Village of Windsor, or the chair of the um, uh, of the um, board there. And um, he and uh, Windsor and Mount um, and DeForest are actually doing a housing study, which should come out next month. So um, we've got a couple of new communities that are um, coming into this uh, and doing this work. So we do have ongoing challenges, however, um, in spite of all the work, good work that you're doing and many other communities are doing. Um, uh, according to uh, Professor Paulson's most recent report, we have 21,465 households, households that are paying more than 50% of their um, area of the uh, of their income on um, rent or mortgage, um, and that's that remains a challenge um, when you consider how much how many housing units that we're actually the city and the county are creating with our new housing funds. In 2019, we created 578 units total, um, with 11 almost 12 million dollars. But when you consider the housing gap just for renters alone. Um, it's going to take us 26.6 years to close that housing supply gap um, for renters who are paying renters alone who are paying more than 50% of their uh, income on rent, and that doesn't account for the 40,000 households that we're going to be um, uh, uh, adding in the next 20 years, um, and approximately 20% of those will be low to moderate income households. And if you add that, we need another 400 um, per year if you stretch it out evenly across the next 20 years. So um, those are some significant numbers, obviously. Um, we do continue to have a homeless children and youth um, population in Dane County, 1,865 according to DPI's um, latest um, um, uh, data. 
And this is just a slide I like to use because it's kind of shows the stark difference. I, you know, I was born around 1965 and in 1965, the median income um, was 34% of the median housing price. Now the median income is approximately 20% of the um, median housing price. So that's a, those are pretty stark, um, that's a pretty stark difference. Um, and I think uh, when I was born, the, the average uh, first time home buyer was 22 or 23. And now the average first time home buyer is uh, 33. So this is there are just some other household population trends that are you know might be helpful to consider as you're considering affordable workforce housing and growing in in um, Mount Horeb. Um, you know the vacancy rates continue to stay extremely low um, for both homeowners um, in particular, but also rental vacancy rates. And these are obviously pre-pandemic. Um, and um, this is a snapshot of the household dis distribution income in Dane County. And when you look at it uh, from this perspective, you can see that 34% of households in Dane County um, are, um, are uh, below um, 50, or, or have income of below $50,000. Uh, $50, and that's about 34%, I wanna say 34, 35% of all households. Um, this is just speaks to the uh, growing diversity of our county. Um, whites alone are 79.2% of the county and uh, people of color, Asian, um, people who identify as Asian, Hispanic or Latino, those are the three um, largest um, uh, minority populations that are growing in our county. And this is an interesting statistic. So 11% of households in Dane County have another language that is spoken at home besides English. Uh, we still have about 12% of our households without broadband. Um, and um, there's 5.6% 5 5 of our population actually uh, below 65, so not including seniors, that is disabled. Another thing to think about when we're, when we're growing our, um, our uh, communities. And I will uh, let you know that um, currently the um, home ownership gap between blacks and whites is about half, uh, or approximately 60% of white, um, white, uh, white um, people in Dane County are homeowners, and about 30 or less than 30% of um, people of color are homeowners. And that gap has grown a little bit um, between 2010 and 2017. So uh, as I said, continue to have homeless children and youth. Um, I think uh, Mount Horeb is actually on this. Uh, you have 12 homeless youth um, currently in Mount Horeb. Um, and this is sort of an interesting uh, snapshot. It kind of shows the trend in, um, in um, owner occupancy, the percent of owner occupancy of all households, and it's gone down from 2010 to 2017 from 61 to 57%. And this is a sort of another way to look at it. Um, you see that uh, one unit detached single family housing has grown 6% in that time frame between 2020 and 2010 and 2019. But multifamily units um, between 10 and 19 units and maybe 20 and, and 20 more uh, units have grown 38% and 26% respectively. That seems to be the trend, um, certainly because of, I think because of the high cost of housing. And um, this slide speaks to the fact that it's, um, we have about 77, well, over 150,000 of our households are actually one and two unit households. And it's about 70, uh, 66, 67% of all households in Dane County um, are actually occupied by just one or two people. Um, and that's a trend that seems to be um, continuing. So um, there, are all different, all, there are all different types of workforce and affordable housing, new multifamily, um, mixed income housing, um, existing housing rehab is a, is a huge um, opportunity. The Dane County Housing Authority provides um, public housing and housing vouchers. And then there's missing middle, which is could be multifamily, habitat for humanity, small format housing, or other alternative types of housing. And this is just an example of some of the, um, some of what this housing looks like. Um, there's a on the left or your right um, is multifamily. That was a rehab um, development in Madison. And on the right, that's multifamily um, attached housing, um, lower, lower density. This is a much higher density, Central Park Apartments in, in the city. And this is a 102 unit property on a former brownfield um, north of here. And then it's another multifamily um, in the city. And this is a pocket neighborhood. Many of you might have seen this before. Um, Professor Landgraf, uh, who spoke at your housing task force last time, um, I think might have presented this information. But this is really very small unit housing clustered closely together. It's called pocket neighborhoods. 
and that's another multifamily um, development in the city of Madison. So um, there are all sorts of ways to uh, bring this housing forward, land use tools, public policy, financing tools that municipalities have, but I think one of our other presenters is gonna be talking a little bit more about that. So that's all I have for now. So thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, next up, we are gonna to move to Robin Farrow. Hi, I did not present slides. That's <laughs> My okay. topic to introduce. So I own, um, started in real estate development as a consultant and I've actually consulted on over a hundred affordable housing projects throughout the United States and the Midwest from tribal housing to senior housing and supportive housing, which would mean people who need housing. Today was to talk a little bit about how do you put a housing project together? And I think I really see it as a four-step process. The most important thing being a need, right? So as a developer, we want to come into a community that has a need for what you're going to present. But with that need, you also need public support. And I think especially in workforce housing, and I like to call it that as opposed to affordable, I think affordable gets a really bad rap as people have these preconceived notions of what subsidized or affordable housing needs means, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about is the people who work with us, who live with us, who are grandparents, who need places to live and wanna stay in the community. And if we think about that housing need, we see it in every community. And so identifying who's going to go into the unit is usually our number one goal. What are we gonna do? Who are we gonna put in there? And then finding a location within the city, like we focus specifically on infill developments, we want to be sustainable in our approach, um, but that doesn't mean that peripheral developments aren't needed, especially in landlocked communities. When you look at Middleton, when you look at Mount Horb, you can't develop everything you want in the heart of the downtown. There's only so many spaces we can put places. Once you identify a need in a location, the biggest hurdle that we face and all of us face is approvals, getting the locals involved, getting the board on, on board. That's even harder than financing. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily want density in their backyard, but we know density is the way we need to grow as a community in order to be more sustainable. And so having conversations, getting people to understand that density brings advantages to towns as well as um, a provides a better tax base and a better tax basis for a community than just large lots with single homes on them. And they're less expensive to produce. That's why when Olivia showed her slide with where multifamily is going from an affordable housing perspective, it's going to larger units because there's co material costs, land costs, development costs are aggregated when we develop on more density in a smaller parcel. And then the final piece of the puzzle is financing. And that's really probably the hardest piece next to approvals and um, where municipalities can have a real impact with developers is helping offset some of our costs so we can provide lower unit pricing to people in the workforce that need these units. So. Um, I'll be around to answer questions, but that was all I was going to talk about at this point. Thank you, Robin. Um, at this time, we'll move on to Chad. Um, I'm going to kind of piggyback on a lot of what Robin said. Um, <clears throat> the first question on my agenda was, what are the greatest barriers to housing programs? And I need to describe myself a little bit. I am a strong proponent of ownership. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be the most affordable person in the room. I'm not. Um, I'm looking for the type of units that families can raise kids that literally can walk out to a yard of some kind without having to walk downstairs or go down the elevator. I thought there's anything wrong with that. It's just that that's my personal goal for the housing type that I would like to see more of at a more affordable level. So we work. We focus on um, density, like Robin said. 
but also we focus on shared community spaces. If you did get a presentation from Professor Landgraf on pocket neighborhoods, what you saw there was uh, efficient use of land and sharing common spaces. And that's what we are strong proponents of. We've also got into land division. And for those of you that have been um, in this industry for a while, you understand that condominium after the crash of 2014 developed a bit of a bad connotation because there was issues with condos. And to this day, you can't do a new condominium project without um, and get your end user to get 30 year fixed financing because banks and um, secondary markets just won't accept that until the project is half sold out. But the condominium idea is a very efficient way to use land and to share resources. So we've developed products and we've developed some um, zero lot line products, for example, that we can build an eight unit in order to create some new home affordability, an eight unit townhome. And we build it basically as, as four duplexes attached in order to save money in the construction process. But also we have just a shared maintenance agreement as opposed to an actual condominium dock. So we avoid the connotation of being a true condominium. So the long and short of it is we're desperately trying to find alternative methods to provide affordability for new home ownership. And what that does, the trickle down effect basically is that if someone moves into, moves up to a new home at say the median price of a new home in the state of Wisconsin, which is right around $340,000 right now, um, it should open up effectively some existing stock to be available to um, new home, first home buyers. Um, because of the delay in home ownership, we are finding that a lot of first home, first time home buyers are buying our product, but it's unusual and it's not typical. It's just a, a question of having delayed purchasing for so long that incomes have now kept up to housing to some degree. That doesn't mean it's a, you know, so it, it doesn't mean that it's affordable, but the more we can build, the more supply there is, and is the demand levels off or keep steady, as long as we have more supply, obviously prices come down. That's simple economics. Um, I do have to share with you guys a study by NAHB um, that I wanted to, you can put it up and I think you can get it online somehow, correct me if I'm wrong, but the nuts and bolts of this, it, it explains the median how the cost of new, new homes in Wisconsin essentially and in Madison and so on and so forth. But it also explains what happens and how many people are priced out of the market every time a home goes up $1,000. Literally $1,000 can reduce the number of pe people in Wisconsin that can buy a new home by 3,500 people approximately. Um, I would say that Mount Horb has done a very good job as opposed to some other communities in Dane County of not trying to dump every expense on the new home buyers and the people that literally don't live in the community yet. So it's a very easy tax because no one can vote against you because they don't live there yet. But Mount Horb's fees are well within reason. And I'm not sucking up to Nick or anything. So this is just a just the reality of it, especially when compared to the largest community in Dane County. How's that for shall remain nameless? Um, and that's critically important. Um, you have to share the burden. Um, and it can't just be all dumped on new homes because if you prohibit new home construction, you're going to drive up the price of your existing stock. There's no two ways about it. It's supply and demand. It's very simple. Um, you've heard rumors about lumber prices going up. It's very true. It's the tip of the iceberg. Almost every commodity is going up right now. Um, labor seems to have leveled off a little bit, but we're under constant pressure from outside um, suppliers, outside forces such as you know increasing permit costs and so on and so forth that keep this balance very difficult. And uh, we need for communities like Mahora to be a little more open to some alternative ideas as opposed to strictly the 8,000 square foot single family lot. And I think that the community is ready for stuff like that. So it's, I'm not, I'm not saying that you aren't, but it, to be creative in those ways are what's gonna create a little more reasonable affordability in a place like Mahora. Um, with that, I'm available for questions, so you understand my perspective, but I'm going to wrap it up there and let you move on. Thanks, Chad. And we also put a link to the information you referenced in the chat. Yep. And Chad, I'm going to, there were, a question came in for you. So 
I'm going to ask it. <laughs> um, how do housing co-ops compare to the condominium model? So, you know, I would have to do a little research to answer that question thoroughly. There has not been a co-op that I've been involved in in quite some time. I do understand the concept, but what would make it it's strictly a different type of ownership, right? A legal type of ownership. Um, whereas it's equally divided amongst everybody. And I'm sorry, but my assistant, lovely assistant sitting right here to correct me if I say something wrong, <laughs> but I'm probably not the great best person to ask that question of. Co-ops are not a common thing around here, but it's something that has happened. I know Mount Horb does have a co-op, and um, but I'm not 100% familiar with how it operates. The, the biggest challenge. Sorry, that wasn't a very good answer. I apologize. They're hard to find. We're getting a couple other questions, but we're going to hold off. We're going to let um, we're going to let Kurt talk, and then we'll get to some other questions if that's all right. Sounds good. Oh, um, thank you for inviting me. Oh. You have to make me a co-host so I can share my screen. Okay, there we go. Uh, you can all see this. Okay, excellent. So uh, thank you to Melissa and uh, Jessica for inviting uh, me today. And it's an honor to be with uh, all of you good people in Mount Horeb and uh, with this distinguished panel. And I'm glad to be on a panel, particularly with, with Chad and Robin, because they're two of the uh, best developers around the county. And I know they can speak very uh, practically about uh, the costs of, and the, the process of developing housing. So uh, again, my name is Kurt Paulson, I'm at the UW. And this is just a disclaimer that, you know, I've worked with a lot of state and county agencies, but uh, this is just my own opinions today. So I sometimes think that uh, when the community and I'm going to cover a lot of the same stuff that Olivia did because we got similar questions to answer. So sometimes this is helpful to think of housing affordability as how all the pieces of the puzzle fit together. So we start on the right hand side with demand, which is that uh, people uh, live in households, right? And uh, as, as Olivia said, uh, many of those are one or two person households, uh, you know, uh, depending on what age you are or whether you have kids. And then you have income that comes from the labor market. So that connects to Robin's point about workforce housing, right? The income people have to spend on housing comes from the uh, employment. And then on the supply side, we have different types of units and different types of prices to meet the needs of different households. So I'm asked to talk a little bit about how Mount Horeb compares to the rest of Dane County. Dane County uh, is an expensive market and a growing market because we have a uh, strong demand for housing good job growth, income growth, household formation, high amenities. So we have an overall supply shortage in Dane County of all types of units. Uh, anyone who's tried to buy a home recently knows that. Uh, there's a shortage of inventory. And so we have low vacancy rates, rising prices, and declining affordability. So you've seen some of these statistics, but uh, just to compare Mount Horeb to Dane County, uh, your median household income is a little bit above. Dane County, uh, but the median household income for homeowners is a little bit less than Dane County. And that includes uh, many of the towns where some of the more expensive housing lives. Uh, but your median renter household is a slightly higher income than Dane County, indicating again that, that income profile of the market that you are serving. Your median house price is about the same as the median in Dane County. Um, and the median growth rent for a two bedroom Right, so the, the median is the middle, it's the 50th percentile. So half of the units are more expensive and half are less is about uh, $941. So again, the takeaway for Dane County, uh, this is a lot of numbers, I apologize, is we are adding population, we're adding households, we're adding jobs, we're adding income, but we are not adding housing units at a fast enough rate to meet the demand. That's why prices are rising that's why supply is short. We're building a lot of units all over the county, but we're not building enough units to keep up with our job and household growth. And as anyone who works in economic development will tell you uh, that if you can't find decent, safe, affordable homes for workers 
in or near the communities where they want to work, that really impacts your ability to grow your regional economy. Uh, rental vacancies are low. Um, I realize that this doesn't cover Mount Horeb because you have your own utility, but this is kind of the average apartment market in Dane County from MG&E. Um, and uh, it shows that rental vacancies are uh, quite low in historical perspective. We would want to see a rental market with about 5% vacancy rates. And uh, you know the current vacancy rate is 3.9%. Uh, so we have a way to go. And again, to, to uh, Olivia's point, the uh, one way to measure overall housing affordability in a region is to look at the average income relative to the average price. And here you see that Madison is the second, Madison Metro is the second most expensive market. So as a general rule, as a housing economist, when we see this number above three, that indicates that housing is pretty expensive for your middle income family. And to Chad's point, uh, I just uh, discussed with Chad earlier today, and I decided to pull the uh, price of lumber from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. You know, and for the last eight or nine years, lumber is about 250 to $300 for a thousand board feet, and it's currently over $800. So on a, on a median priced home in Dane County, lumber alone is gonna add 15 to $25,000 to the cost of a new home. So unless we bring this down, um, a lot of the affordability challenges are gonna just be even more difficult to address in the county. Olivia already talked about um, how we think about, uh, as, in terms of housing policy, how we translate the income that people earn in the labor market to how much they can afford to spend. You've already seen this. So I'm gonna show you a, a slightly different slide, which is this income translated to how much home you could afford to purchase. So if we think of a, a family of three, again, uh, making about $54,000, uh, that's about 60% of AMI, they can afford to buy a home in Dane County of about $201,000. And as any of you have looked for houses recently, there's not a lot of supply at that price point. All right, so again, when we think about this, we wanna say that there's a wide range of households, different sizes, different ages, different income levels, and everybody needs a safe, decent, affordable place to live. If we don't have enough supply of different types of houses at different price points, then people get squeezed and they either have to spend too much on housing or live really far away from where they work. Um, that's the cost of lumber, right. So uh, I was also asked to talk a little bit about how the housing stock in Mount Horeb compares to the rest of the county. And as you can see, if you compare yourself to the average other villages in Dane County, then your supply of housing in terms of how much is single family and how much is multifamily is approximately in the middle of what the other villages provide. You know, as we look at this, we would think, okay, uh, Mount Horeb has a little bit more than other villages in the small multifamily, the five to nine units, and a little bit less than other cities and villages in the large multifamily. And so as you think about your future housing stock and ho housing supply, Right, it's, it's about on average for what a village would be. It's obviously a, a less multifamily than the county as a whole, because that includes large cities. So as you go forward, one perhaps strategy to consider is to kind of replicate this percentage. So about 64% of new housing being single family housing, uh, and then the rest being uh, uh, attached housing or multifamily. So this is also uh, your housing study committee. Uh, it looked at this data, and this is the current value of housing in Mount Horeb uh, relative to fair market value. You can see that there's uh, some good affordability in Mount Horeb um, relative to the rest of the county because about 78% of all your homes are for sale below 349,000. And again, that's a good price point because as Chad was pointing out, about 350 is a kind of medium quality, uh, new construction price. And of course, uh, for most people, if that's out of reach, you're going to be buying existing housing stock. So I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, cost burden, right? And these are uh, renters and owners paying more than 50% of their income 
on housing in uh, Mount Horeb. So this is just obviously uh, it's a larger challenge by numbers in the cities, but here you can see that in uh, Mount Horeb, um, for owner households, you have uh, about 200 owner households who pay more than half of their income in rent. These are probably seniors facing um, higher costs for property taxes and utilities. They may have owned their home when they were working um, and now their income is down, they're retired. So this is a good example for housing strategy for perhaps a homeowner affordable rehab program uh, for seniors. And then you have about a 90 uh, renting households uh, that pay more than half of their income in rent. And that's kind of the um, broad um, uh, kind of overview I was asked to provide. I guess I'll just step back with kind of, a, a, again, a, a general comment, which is that Mount Horeb, uh, it's really exciting to see that you're having a community conversation and a housing strategy committee. Um, and this is an important conversation to have. And so I'm excited to be with you. And again, if we keep in mind uh, that everybody needs a decent place to live and that when we talk about workforce and affordable housing, it's easy to kind of stereotype this as uh, something somewhere else, but these are teachers and nurses and firefighters and police officers and the person who works uh, serving beer at the Grumpy Troll. And uh, if people work in our community, then they should be able to uh, live in our community. Thank you. Thank and you. yes, my slides will be available at the link that Melissa posted. Because yep. that's a lot of data in a short period of time. Thank you. Um, we did have some questions submitted ahead of time, and we wanted to try to work through those first before we move to the questions that were posted in the chat. So I'm just going to go ahead and read off some of the questions that came in um, over the last week. So um, this is for our panel and for uh, Nick and Rowan. Uh, as a professional working in the multifamily housing typology for many years, we are always looking for innovative ways to create a variety of housing types to meet the socioeconomic needs of all people that make up a diverse and vibrant city. Where we find challenges is with the economics of land values, building costs and governing zoning codes, making the realities of affordable housing difficult to achieve in several cases. Mm -hmm. Several cities throughout the US are looking into how the local zoning codes can be adapted for to allow for more density at a variety of scales to help make these projects more economically viable. What experiences and concepts have any of the members of the panel had with these challenges? Or what projects have you worked on where more density would have allowed for greater affordable housing options to be offered? I can jump in a little bit here. Um, and I think that the PUD process that Middleton's put in place actually that lets you make a case for different densities and different designs based on how the land you envision is gonna be used is a really transformational way to look at land use. So it allows a developer to come up in and say how, you can use land differently and how you can implement projects differently. And oftentimes our zoning is so rigid and so structured that you don't see what's possible because you've defined your box so narrowly. Kurt's shaking his head because he's involved with that process a lot. Yeah, and, and so to Robin's point, I'm, I live in Middleton and I'm on the plan commission. And so, um, when I spoke to your housing strategy committee, I showed them a number of developments that we've done recently in our city. So as Robin's talking about, when we provide a flexible zoning for a new neighborhood, we really wanna see a developer provide a range of housing types. So in one neighborhood, rather than just every house being the same size, the same lot size, the same zoning, we'll allow a flexibility. So what that means is in a new neighborhood, we might have some multifamily rental. We might have some smaller lot single family, and, and Chad can talk about uh, can, you know, a chapel view that they're doing over on the west side of Madison, but we will allow even uh, someone to develop a smaller house on a smaller lot. So if you think of a traditional zoning lot, like in Mount Horeb, 8,000 square feet, 
it might be 80 feet in the front of the house, the frontage on the road, and 100 feet deep of the lot. And we will sometimes allow a 40 foot wide lot uh, and a narrower lot. And then uh, the parking is in the back and shared parking with the driveway. And so I know Chad and Robin know how to do this math. Every square foot uh, you can reduce your lot sizes uh, is uh, something that you can reduce the sale cost of the house. And if you don't have to provide infrastructure for every linear foot of these wide lots, you can be a lot more flexible. So if you look at our new neighborhoods, we have small houses on small lots and big houses on big lots. And it gives the developer a little more flexibility to kind of meet that market need. And so, you know, as, as Chad knows, he's developing some townhouses in Middleton, right? And we really noticed uh, there wasn't a lot of move down product for our seniors who want a smaller home. They still want an ownership opportunity. So he's building some really nice townhouses right near a, a conservancy. Um, and that's somewhere where, where cities can really work with a developer to be flexible, to meet the demand for different types of products for different types of families. Uh, yeah, I'll chime in. You, you both are exactly correct. Madison has a zoning district and it's called a residential building complex because they don't like PUDs. They don't like the, the unknown of what's coming next in a PUD. But they realized as we went through the process that this residential building complex, which sounds on the surface like something that would be designed for apartments, never said they had to be attached. So that's how we were able to um, reduce the amount of required green space, reduce the amount of required setbacks and cr create the lots that are much more small and shared green space. I mean, green space is important, but at some point in time, maybe not everybody can be afford to have their own backyard. You got to share a little bit. And that's what that's where the affordability comes into play because land is extremely expensive. They're not making any more of it. And um, every time I have buy land from a farmer, it's generally generations of people that have built this land forever and ever. And this is their last chance to set up a legacy for their family. So they're not going to discount any land just because we're trying to build houses for new families. They're gonna take advantage of it. So the more efficiently we can use that land, the better off everybody is. Okay, well, we'll move on to our next question. Um, the question is, I was wondering if we're going to hear information about the new apartments that are supposed to be built near the fire station. For example, how many units will be available as affordable housing? The rumor is only 11. And when is it supposed to be complete and how soon can we apply? And any details about the units that a prospective renter would be interested in? And if not enough affordable units are available, what will the regular rents be? And I think Rowan had mentioned that possibly the developer is here tonight with us. Yeah, I just glanced at the attendance list. It looks like we have a couple representatives. So if uh, you're there, Ted, if you wanna unmute and talk about that, that'd be super. Here you go. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, yeah, Ted Madcom. I'm the Wisconsin market president with Gorman and Company. And uh, we are doing a project um, at, right at Blue Mounds there. Um, we have 51 apartments that are going there. I think that the, the, the person who made the question say 11 or something or? Yeah. Um, I don't know, but it was 51 we're doing. Um, most of them, uh, all except I believe six, uh, will be affordable. The other six will be market rate. And in the um, in the development we're doing, we are doing a WIDA Section 42 uh, development. And you've probably heard of Section 8. Have you guys heard of Section 8 housing? Okay, we're not doing Section 8 housing. What Section 8 housing is, is when the government pays your rent, okay? In section 42, what happens is we get tax credits, which is kind of a, an ethereal concept, but a tax credits from WIDA, Wisconsin Housing Economic Development Association, and they give us tax credits that we sell in the marketplace. And I'll sell them to JP Morgan Chase or Associated Bank, some big bank that's gonna be around because it's a 10 year tax credit. 
and I'll take those proceeds I get from those tax credits and it'll actually subsidize my construction cost. And so my debt on my, uh, on my building will be lower and that'll allow me to charge lower rent. And the lower the income that I target, the lower the rent that I can charge. And the rent is geared to about 30% 30, 30 of your disposable income. So there's varying um, income levels that will be there. I think Kurt talked about that and gave you those, um, those levels, but it's, it's about a 60% county median income average is what we're, we're going for a little below that, maybe 58, but we have 50% units, 30% units, 60% units and market rate. And that's the new formula for affordable housing in today's marketplace is to put all these diverse incomes together uh, to make one great community. And uh, the great thing about the section 42 project or a product is that this will be as good or better than any market rate development that will come down the pike at Mount Horeb. In terms of quality, you walk in there, I'd love to give all of you a, a tour of it. It'll be an amazing product, but then your rent is lower. That means that's really quality affordable housing is you're getting a market rate apartment, but your rent is sized to your income. Uh, so um, we have 51 units and uh, 40, I think 46 of them are affordable. Uh, anywhere from, uh, you know, about average of 60% of the county median income, which in Mount Horeb was about 45,000 for an individual, family of four is about 50,000. Your rent would be about, if you're an individual, about 750 for a one bedroom. And for your, uh, your two bedrooms, you'd be about 950 or so. Your three bedrooms would be about 1,100. but it depends on your income. So, you know, if you have lower income, you'll have a little lower rent than that, but that's about the average. Okay, I think we had a couple more questions both in the chat and maybe from our list about this development. So I think we'll ask those now. Um, Melissa, did you have the chat one? Um, I have one, um, it says in Mount Horeb, we already have many affordable housing units. After the Lansby Ridge project, are there plans for additional affordable housing projects? I guess that's not particularly about what your development is. Right, did you want me to answer that or? No, I... that's okay. Let me see if there was any others in the list that was I, Can I just follow up on something Ted said? Sure. So, um, uh, Ted's company is uh, Gorman and Company, and they're a very high quality developer around uh, Dane County. And we have a number of uh, developers that do these tax credit developments. And I would encourage you to take a tour sometime because people's perceptions of what affordable housing is, uh, is really out of date. So we have a couple in Middleton and we take people on tours of them. And if I didn't tell you that this was a, a unit financed by the tax credit, you would never know. It looks like a market rate unit. And uh, these private developers, particularly Gorman, really good in terms of property maintenance, tenant screening, and supportive services. So again, I think uh, it's gonna be a very successful project. Um, and as you see it, you will, you will learn to appreciate the value it adds to your community. Okay, uh, from the chat from NBC 15, are Mount Horeb residents and workers going to have first chance at the Lansby Ridge project? Yes, so, um, and then I think she's got another one, are convicted felons going to be allowed to reside in Lansby Ridge? So I'll take both of those. Um, as Kurt indicated, we have, we have extensive screening. Uh, I'll take the, the convicted felons ones first. Um, Per uh, the Section 42 guidelines, convicted felons are not uh, allowed in uh, the housing. So we would not have convicted felons living in our building, no. Um, but there are people who are, um, some people who have compromised um, backgrounds in terms of uh, uh, what you would call a record or a history. Uh, those people we try to help. 
and we try to uh, make people uh, better with the housing. Uh, but uh, convicted felons are not allowed in there. Um, and, and that's our screening criteria. Um, the residents of Mount Horeb, uh, what we've got certain parameters for fair housing that we have to follow in terms of renting. Uh, and, and we start applications 120 days prior to the, the, the uh, development being placed in service. So for Lansby Ridge, just to give you an example, we will be starting that project in say June, and then it's going to be uh, finished in 14 months. So let's say it'd be June, July, August of 2022. So we would start taking applications 120 days prior to August, 2022, but we keep a special interest list of people who want to rent there. So anyone will put up a number when we start construction who calls that number and puts their name in, we will send you the application in a sense first because you were the first people who reached out and then you will have to fill out an application and go through our process. But we can't process applications until 120 days prior to the opening of, of the development. Uh, does that answer that? I think so. I have another one for you, um, for Ted. Um, are workers in Mount Horeb going to be getting preference for that project? Oh, in terms of working on the project? I, I think, because earlier, yeah. Yeah. Was, you know, yeah, residents so, and workers are gonna have first chance. Yeah, so we, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have a job fair uh, where we will uh, have, um, uh, the opportunity for local workers to come in and um, apply for jobs, the people who are interested in trades or other things. And we will, um, we will definitely open up there. That's the one thing about Gorman and Company that we pride ourselves on is we go local and we hire local. And so we will uh, pr present that opportunity. We don't know exactly when we're closing because the markets are in flux. I think was it Kurt or Chad? I can't remember. I think Kurt, you did the lumber thing, didn't you? Yep. I mean, that's just scary. It's three. You know, what was that? Is it was that a three hundred percent increase? Um, right. In lumber, uh, that's just killing us. Nick is trying to help us um, with um, some waiver of <laughs> some impact fees uh, that we're trying to get for affordable housing, just to kind of try to mitigate the cost here. Uh, we are right now uh, not in a position to close. So we're trying to figure out in our budget how we can close with the cost going up. Um, it's, it's absolutely astronomical. Uh, I, I think Kurt um, even maybe understated a little bit. Uh, labor has luckily uh, stabilized, but we are still uh, in a materials crunch. I think it's due to COVID some way, somehow. I, I don't have the analytics for that but uh, it's definitely unexplainable to me. Um, so we have, a, we have a clarification question um, that they were wondering if people who live in Mount Horeb or um, like actual Horeb. Mount Horeb residents will get first shot at living in the- Yeah, I think I, I tried to answer that before in the sense that I, I can't process applications until 120 days before it opens, but I will take a special interest list and provide all those people who are interested in application first and that special interest list will be uh, will have a sign at the site when we're closing that'll have a number that if you call, you will be able to be on that special interest list. You will get the application first on the first 120 days. So I can't guarantee it, but I can say that you will be right up there in terms of the first to apply. Yes. And I have one more question for you, then we'll let you off the hook for now. <laughs> Somebody really wants to know about pets and if pets of all sizes will be allowed in your development. Uh, there is a restriction of pets. Um, you can't, you, you can't, I, I don't actually, if you're going to say a St. Bernard, I don't know if that's, uh, I, there is a restriction in terms of size, but it's a reasonable restriction. So okay. I would say 90% of your pets will be allowed. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Melissa, can I, can I respond? I just want to put this yeah. in context. So that people understand, there are uh, private 
apartment builders like Steve Brown or Robbins building apartments for us in Middleton. And they have no income restriction, which means that still an apartment owner is going to do a tenant screening. They're going to look at your credit history and they're going to, you're going to fill out an application. The only really difference in these affordable units that, that uh, Gorman is building is that there's, in addition to that screening, there's an income criteria. And that's uh, all that we're talking about here. So I, I have to be honest, I'm a little... Um, concerned when people immediately go to uh, concerns about crime when we talk about affordable housing, because we're talking about people in the workforce, uh, people who serve us coffee, and their kids go to our kids' schools. And so uh, this, uh, I think we have to be a little careful about this language that people are implying about who's going to occupy uh, these units, right? Because everybody needs a decent, safe, affordable place to live. I'd like to chime in on that too, because I've noticed in some of the comments they talk about um, renters not having the same kind of skin in the game, so to speak, as a homeowner in a community. And in fact, we find that untrue is that a good rental community will engender a sense of community. And whether whatever income bracket we're talking about, if people take pride in where they live and are treated well as residents of that community, they will be an asset to the community. There's not higher crime rates. There's not less engagement in your community. There's not lesser quality of people that show up in your housing projects. And in fact, millennials in particular are owning less property, partially because they don't have the down payments, partially because they've seen a lot of their parents lose their housing or get stuck in when the housing market crashed, being underwater with mortgages that and they don't want to get into. And third, they're more transient than our generation was. And so this renter perception, especially when it comes to affordable housing, is a really hard thing. It's really important to get people out of that perception of what a renter is. Renters can be of any demographic and mostly are great people, and I'm happy to work with them. Um, what, one thing I'll just say about our project in Lansby Ridge is, to all our projects is we build, uh, design, and manage all of our projects. So, um, you know, we get all the compliments and, and we get all the complaints. And the nice thing about it is I will, you know, you guys come to a, uh, a tour or if you stop by or go to Nick, he'll give you my name and my number and I will answer the phone. It's actually me. Um, and, uh, and I will address every single complaint. If there is a, no, a noise complaint, some type of nuisance complaint that you're afraid of or scared of or something, we, we do address it. We have uh, on our lease, we have what are called community guideline rules that everyone has to follow those rules as a part of our tenant base, um, which are just as enforceable as any part of their lease, you know, as paying the rent. And so our communities, I, I would stand up our communities to any others in the nation in terms of, uh, you know, the, the quality and the residents and the people that live in there. Uh, as you indicated, these are real residents of the community. They're, nine times out of 10 working in the community because they want to live close to where they work and uh, they're part of the community. And, um, and it, you're right. I think, I think a, a renter gets a bad rap, but it, it definitely has a value to the community that I, I hope you will all see here because I think it's there. Okay, great. Jessica, you want to? Yeah, I think we'll go back to some of the questions that were submitted um, yeah. previously. Um, this one is, um, how is energy efficiency currently being included in the affordable housing plan conversation? Yeah, do you want to do that one? I, wanna... I know Robin will have something to say. She worked in this field for a no, number of years. Don't say how long, Kurt. 20 plus years, sorry. <laughs> Um, I am a firm believer that energy efficiency is essential when we build projects. So that's our take. Um, it's good for the owner of the project because it lowers our overall operating costs, right? So the less we have to pay to operate a building, 
the less we have to charge for rents. But then we also believe it's great for our residents because the rest, less it is to operate a unit, the less it is for it, the less likely they're going to leave our unit, right? If you come from an apartment or a house that you had to pay two or three times a utility bill versus what you pay in a new stock or a remodeled stock that looks at energy efficiency, you're going to stay in that space. But the other thing energy efficiency gives you is sound deadening, right? Better windows, better insulation makes your unit better to live in and doesn't have as much sound transfer, especially when you're looking at larger multifamily apartments. And so, um, that's actually what my work's been in. And I see a lot of affordable housing spending a lot more money in sustainability because it's become something that allows them to maintain their stock better, maintain their rental units, um, and keep their people in and not moving and not turning over. And I think as, as the village thinks about um, you know, blending your older stock with your newer stock, one of the things we're seeing around Dane County is cities and villages are recognizing that you have a lot of older housing stock. And that might be a single family home of a older homeowner or a kind of older multifamily built in the eighties. And so uh, energy efficiency retrofits and rehabs, they pay for themselves in seven to 10 years in improved uh, cash flow of the building. They improve the quality of air indoors for residents. So that's, it's really a win-win. Um, and that's an area where cities and villages can provide financial assistance even to existing homeowners to uh, upgrade their furnace or windows of uh, older, older housing stock. Okay. Uh, what are plans for seniors aging in place? What efforts are being considered to encourage rural seniors to move to Mount Horeb? My question is about senior housing needs for people who don't need assisted living or nursing home type of care. Yeah. I can uh, start to address that. Right now, uh, we're just in the start of our uh, housing task force process. We're, we're learning more about the different types of affordable and workforce housing, and senior housing is definitely a component of that. Uh, we understand what our population base is in Mount Horb. We understand there's a lot of uh, people in the senior category moving into that senior category that uh, are looking. Um, so that is definitely one thing we're gonna address. But as I mentioned, uh, there's nothing right now in concrete for a plan for that. But that is definitely, you know, first and foremost on our mind. And, and as you think about senior housing in your community, again, it's about providing a range of options. So uh, there are older homeowners who live in single family homes who want to age in place. And so Monona in uh, just outside of Madison has a really interesting program. It's the Renew Monona Loan Program. You can, if you're income eligible, you get a zero interest loan to kind of rehab your house, um, whether it's an accessibility or, or energy efficiency. Uh, but then it's also looking at things like uh, perhaps townhouses in uh, older or newer neighborhoods of town so that seniors have kind of a, a, uh, an ownership product, but kind of a move down product that's not as big as a, a single family house. Kurt, I have a question. Is that just for seniors or that's for the population in general, right? That's for anyone, right? So, right. and, and as, as, uh, as Chad was pointing out, if you have a senior who, uh, like my mom, who owns the house I grew up in and it's four bedrooms and she's 85 and just one person, right? Maybe that's too much house. So if she can move to a condo or a townhouse or something else, uh, then that opens up that existing home for uh, a younger family to be able to, to move into. So, um, Building more senior housing is just good for everybody overall. Um, I want yeah. to jump in too. I think one of the best community planning pieces you can put in is accessory flats, granny flats, um, allowing a second living location on an existing single family parcel. There's a lot of uh, data on how aging in place and keeping seniors in the community can be accomplished that way. So, um, it, it's a huge need. We know that there's going to be a huge senior boom with the baby movers and there's not enough places for them to live that have enough accommodations for what they're going to need within their housing stock. And I'll just come in too, because uh, 
from my experience working in municipalities around Dane County, I would say that senior housing just might be the number one thing I hear people talk about and I don't wanna say complain about, but you know, their seniors are very concerned. Um, they are um, in many cases getting taxed out of their communities. And it's, um, it's, a, very, it's a very urgent issue for many seniors in Dane County. One thing to add about that is Kurt brought up Renew Monona. Renew Monona was funded by TIF, and there's a great deal of misunderstanding in the general population about what TIF means. I think it's important that people understand the realities of TIF because it is a valuable tool, not only for developers and individuals, but for municipalities as well. Monona is thrived because of TIF. They are a prime example of how to make TIF work for the village, for the community, basically. Before we get too far away from um, accessory dwelling units, we did have a question about that. Um, the, the person writes, my question is on the progress and current laws in Mount Horeb on building an ADU in Mount Horeb Village in the town of Springdale. Has there been any research or progress in allowing this type of building to address affordable housing in the area? I could not speak to the town of Springdale. Uh, that's a totally separate body from us. You'd have to address that with uh, their their village off or their town office. But I don't believe we permit anything like that in Mount Horb uh, at the current time. But you know, as Robin mentioned, that might be an alternative that we're, comes out of our housing task force as a recommendation. I think we're looking for you know any and all creative and feasible ideas for that. I will say the town zoning code, um, because the uh, planning department, the Dane County Planning and Development Department does enforce that. Um, so they do allow for uh, permitted um, uh, units that are actually attached um, as part of the single, the primary residence, um, but you do need a permit. Uh, a, a, you know, you need to go through a CP process if you want to have an, an additional unit. And there are some size restrictions for the town's um, we had a kind of a zoning question come in. What are the current lot size and minimum build size rules in Mount Horeb? In the 1950s, the median family home in the U.S. was 800 square feet. I believe it is currently illegal to build a home less than 1,200 square feet under Mount Horeb's rules. Is there a proposal to amend these rules to allow for affordable home building and ownership? So currently 10,000 is the minimum uh, square footage allowed for a lot. I don't believe we actually have a minimum house size. We've been asked that question before. We've searched code for it, and I don't believe it's in there. Um, but I know that uh, I think, as Chad's mentioned, and other people that you know, going smaller lots, land cost is a huge part of lots here in Mount Horb and everywhere. Uh, that's definitely an option we're going to be looking at. I know we've talked in the housing study. We saw presentations on pocket neighborhoods. Uh, cottage neighborhood type development. So the, the smaller lot is definitely something that we will be considering in the, the near future. And, and Nick, I actually uh, scanned your zoning ordinance too, and there's no uh, minimum size of a house, but you do have a minimum lot size as, as Nick pointed out. And the truth is, and, and, and Chad knows this and Robin knows this, if you're paying a lot of money for the land and you're a, you're a builder um, and you're paying $200,000 an acre for development land, uh, and then you're adding the cost of infrastructure. On a 10,000 square foot lot, which is about a quarter of an acre, there's no way you'd build an 800 square foot house or even a 1,600 square foot, three bedroom, two bath house. Because with land costs so high, it means that builders and developers, in order to capture that cost again, they're gonna have to build a larger house that kind of targets the, the luxury or, or high amenity uh, side of the market just to cover their land and infrastructure costs. So again, one of the ways to bring down the cost of housing for more families is allow smaller houses on smaller lots that more flexibility uh, to provide a range of product that, that people would want, right? Nobody's gonna pay $100,000 for a lot and then put an 800 square foot house on it because it's just not economically viable. And there's also, I don't know if I'm muted. We can um, hear you. Uh, there's also a demand in Mount Horeb. So we can create more affordable housing, but there's still going to be a demand for that large lot because in other places you can't get that anymore. Mount Horeb has some of that availability. People still want a three-car garage on occasion. And so that doesn't go away just because we add more affordable 
product to the mix. This is kind of a lengthy one. Um, in all discussions thus far and going forward, is the task force housing committee including new developments already approved with many in progress? Um, the Lansby Ridge affordable apartments are equal 51. Sienna Hills barrier free ranch condos have 18. Third apartment building under construction on Brookwood Drive by Millers, approximately 63. John DeWitt, final home addition on Brookwood, St. Olaf area, 43. Cara View Estates Home Development, 17. Stonehaven Estates, 6. And Bourne Development, 5. These current approved developments total slightly over 200, with a minimum of 25% for affordable housing, workforce housing. What percentage of housing does Mount Horeb need for workforce affordable housing? The 25% reference does not include existing affordable apartments and duplexes. And then also, is the committee using the MIT living wage calculator as a reference? I'm not sure where you want to start with that one. The short version of that um, was just written in the chat. Okay. <laughs> she asked it right, be right before you asked the question. <laughs> so okay. if you can read it, you can read it over there. All right, so the short version. Well, uh, the, the short answer is that okay. as part of the community planning process, both through your comprehensive plan and again, the housing strategy committee that you're looking at, right? You forecast out what your expected housing unit growth is, and state law says you have to prepare a plan to accommodate your projected housing growth. And that means not just total number of units, but you're thinking about how much of that will be single family, how much will be a smaller lot, how much maybe multifamily or townhouses. And so I know that the uh, Housing Strategy Committee is looking at that, and they're assembling all that data. I just don't have it uh, at present what that is. But a good target for a community is to look at, uh, as you're adding jobs and as you're adding people, some percentage of that should be affordable to kind of keep the balance within your community. Uh, so that could be 20 to 30%, depending on what your employment looks like and what your other housing stock looks like. Okay. Anyone else have any input on that question? I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, what is the usual way this type of housing gets its funding? I think we kind of touched on that tonight. Does the resulting building end up in the property assessment tax base so that overall village tax rates may be reduced? Um, I can talk a little bit to the taxation rate. Oh, Did we lose her? I think we we may have lost in the her. City and also to help um, affordable requirements as much as, am I unstable? It says, uh, can you guys hear me? Now we can. Okay. We, lost, we lost you for a minute. So maybe start at the beginning. Uh, I was saying Kurt, Kurt brought up uh, and, and Chad both brought up TIF as a way to help development within the community. And I think you guys should talk about a whole session on that because people really don't understand it. But um, tying affordable units, especially in bigger projects to having a little bit of affordability within what they're looking for from a development standpoint, isn't a bad way to look at incenting people to add more affordable projects within their community. Now, some developers, I'm, I am maybe a little bit on an island, some developers don't like requirements and I don't necessarily like requirements for affordable but incentives for affordable through the TIF process can really help ensure that you get some affordability into any new project that comes into the village. Chad may disagree with me. I don't no, I don't disagree at all. I um I think that all of this adds an increment and adds tax base. I don't know how you argue with that. And I think it, <clears throat> it's, it's that simple. And that tool that can take underutilized land and turn it into something that benefits the school district, municipality and the county 
is a valuable tool. And I do think that it's generally misunderstood. And it's looked at as a developer's handout, which at the end of the day, it's not because if it didn't have something like that, the project never would have started. So then the village and the school district sit without increased taxes, essentially, to keep this, to keep it. And I think, and, and as you know, we don't really often talk about the economic development, you know, sort of the cost benefit of if this project doesn't come forward, but you know, these projects create hundreds of jobs. They bring residents, um, they potentially create new openings if your residents are moving from either larger homes or different homes um, or moving into, into homes that, that they wouldn't necessarily have an opportunity to live in. So you're, you know, you're adding new tax base, you're adding new jobs, you're adding new residents, potentially new residents, um, especially if you're freeing up other homes. So there's a whole other economic development, you know, sort of um, influx uh, and that we don't really talk about a lot in affordable housing. Um, and all of those additional, you know, um, workers that potentially your employers have access to. So when you think about, you know, should we do it or should we not do it, you know, it's important to consider the whole piece as opposed to just the actual building and, and, and what it looks like in the site itself. Cause there's that whole period of 14 to 16 months of construction where you're creating, you know, jobs for people um, and all the spending, the ancillary spending that's gonna happen with all that construction going on in addition to all those new homes and workers and, you know, um, an additional tax base. So it's a pretty comprehensive thing that happens when, you know, especially a multifamily unit gets built. Yeah, and, and, and I can speak to that workforce. I mean, having two businesses in, in Mount Horeb, that availability of, of workers that can live and work and work at businesses in Mount Horeb. If we wanna to continue to have a vibrant downtown and we wanna to continue to grow, having available housing for them is a key piece. I, we can't recruit a lot of people that will be willing to drive from Madison to come and work at our businesses. You've got four new things opening downtown and we're all struggling with having available workers that wanna come in, except teenagers that wanna work at a candy store. There's a thousand of them for some reason, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure every one of us as a business owner downtown is struggling with making sure we have a vibrant workforce that, that wants to live and work in our community. And it, it's important for people to understand that if, if Robin or another developer builds a market rate apartment or Ted builds a, a, an affordable apartment with the tax credit, those are both on the tax rolls, 100% of full uh, assessed value. So um, I don't know where people sometimes get the idea that these uh, affordable apartments are not on the tax rolls, right? They add tremendous value to our tax base. Um, and for, for cities and villages, your ability to raise additional revenue to cover services, whether that be police or fire or, or pave the roads, you're only allowed each year over year in the state to grow your, your tax levy based on the percent increase in uh, new construction. So if, you, if you're not building new development, then your tax base uh, is, is pretty fixed and you have to spread your increased uh, police and fire and EMS costs over uh, fewer, fewer people. In turn, reduces affordability. Yes. I'm cutting in now because I've got another question for you. <laughs> Um, this one's for Olivia specifically, but anybody else can mention too. It says, Olivia, you mentioned the county has a financing solution for down payment on affordable housing. Is this for individuals and families only or also available to landlords and development, developers? And how do we find out more about this program? So that county, that refers to a county program called HOME. Um, it's part of the CDG and HOME program that we have that I talked about, have $1.2 million for a whole variety of affordable housing um, uh, needs, rehab, um, energy, um, energy uh, upgrades, um, down payment assistance and gap financing. So you would contact the, um, uh, you would contact the CDBG program. And we actually just hired the new CDG program specialist. So if you want to send me your email or someone wants to give me an email, I can send you the right contact to find out about that. And it's no, uh, the, the CDBG funds um, are for individuals. The down payment assistance is for individuals, for home, home buyers. Yeah. I just posted a link in the chat. If people are interested in down payment assistance in Dane County. You go to homebuyersroundtable.org and that has all the information you need. 
Thanks. Um, that's a nice. It's a nice website. Well, I think we will wrap up here. Um, we're getting close to our eight o'clock time, and we want to be respectful of everybody's time tonight. Um, I just want to say thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you to our community for coming out and asking your questions. And thank you to our village administration for being available tonight. Is there anything else um, that anyone had wanted to say from our panel or from our village administration before we close out tonight? I think the only thing I will say to close up is that, you know, um, you know, affordable housing is a complicated issue and it's uh, not something uh, that we have had to really think about a lot as residents and community members um, for those who, folks who have been in their own homes for a long time. Um, and that um, it's understandable to have a lot of questions and, you know, um, change is difficult and it's, and it's understandable. And I think the it becomes easier the more you learn about it and the more you have conversations about it. So I encourage you to continue the conversation in whatever way you can, whether it's through your task force or, um, you know, with your neighbors. But there is a lot of information, you know, available online. Uh, please feel free to go to the Dane County Housing Initiative um, website. Um, and um, I, the other thing I will say is that you know, we have a housing supply gap and the, and the housing supply gap is actually um, for the residents that already live in Mount Horeb. Um, so um, we're not talking when, when, you know, you're talking about development, you're actually referring to development and new housing opportunities for your seniors who want to age in place or the workforce that's already there. So you're actually not talking about solving the problem for, you know, you know, the whole region, you're really talking about at least what I understand the data that you're looking at is really looking at just the, the housing gap that's in Mount Horeb. So you're really trying to create more affordable housing so the folks who are, are there can actually stay there and, you know, continue to live there. I think that's the, the sort of target that you're talking about in your, um, with your data. So that's it. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Nice to see you, Nick and Ron. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, echo Jess Jessica's thank yous to everybody who attended tonight uh, and as well as all the panelists. There's a lot of great information. As was brought up uh, during the meeting, we are working on um, the housing task force. And one of the next things coming out of that is going to be a community survey uh, to gain input from the community on uh, their thoughts on housing, housing availability, uh, housing needs. So that'll be coming out. We're going to try various uh, various different avenues to get that out, social media, websites, emails. Uh, I think we're gonna try and get an article in the paper. So just uh, watch for that coming out, I believe uh, April-ish. Rowan, are you nodding? Um, <laughs> I think it was, yeah, mid, mid April to early May, I think. And uh, Jessica flashed our emails up there. So if you have any questions, uh, we're also our contact information's on the Village website. So thank you again. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.